on Article 4. The fourth article respects the perpetual obligation of our solemn covenants and the propriety of the renovation of Arkansas, 1712. The great and important duty of public covenanting, even in New Testament times, hath been so fully illustrated and clearly defended in many publications, both ancient and modern, that we reckon it quite superfluous to enter into a discussion of the subject here. While we firmly believe that the public covenants of ancient Israel comprehended great and important moral duties equally incumbent upon men in all periods of the church, while we find that the first commandment of the moral law, in the true scope of it, requires us to avouch the Lord to be our God and to persevere in his worship and service, the very substance of all proper religious covenanting, while we cannot refuse that the third commandment, rightly understood, plainly teaches us to fear the Lord our God and, when lawfully called unto it, to swear by his name, while we read many precious predictions in the Old Testament, foretelling that in the days of the Messiah men should subscribe with their hand unto the Lord, vow a vow unto him, and perform it, and should say, Come, and let us join ourselves unto the Lord in a perpetual covenant, never to be forgotten. And we will find that every baptized Christian, taking the Bible into his hand as the rule of his faith and practice, sitting down at the holy table of the Lord, and opening his mouth in a public profession of the Christian religion, evidently doth what is to all intents and purposes substantially the same with solemn covenanting. Though we had no other arguments for it, we cannot withhold our consent to the propriety of our ancestors' conduct in taking the burden upon them for themselves and their posterity, that they would be for God and not for another, in the believing improvement of his gracious promise, quote, I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, unquote. A very slight attention to our solemn covenants will serve to show that the matter of them is scriptural, and that, therefore, they may be safely sworn. As to the national covenant of Scotland, its great object is, evidently, the renouncement of popery, together with all superstitions of the same description, but if the Church of Rome be the mystical Babylon of the New Testament, if the Romish Church indeed be false, blasphemous, idolatrous, bloody, soul-ruining, and deceitful, as hath often been abundantly proved, and as the Presbytery hath shown in their, quote, testimony and warning against popery, unquote, then the divine injunction applies in its full force, quote, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, unquote. Our obedience to this sovereign command is very properly testified, by seriously swearing in the name and strength of the Lord, never to touch the unclean thing. A great many acts of Parliament are introduced into this national covenant. The reason is sufficiently obvious. Our reformers at that time were considered by many by taking, as taking too much upon them, acting beyond their commission, and laying themselves open to the charge of seditious conduct. In their own vindication, they quoted these numerous acts to prove that they were doing nothing but what was authorized by the fundamental laws of the kingdom, as well as by the word of God. If those who approve of the covenant have an opportunity of seeing and reading these acts for their own satisfaction, it is well they should certainly embrace the opportunity. At the same time, though they should never have it in their power to see one of them, yet it is practicable for them to swear the covenant itself in truth, in righteousness, and in judgment. They have the body of the solemn deed, and may, at all times, compare it with the infallible standing, excuse me, the infallible standard of right or and wrong. It is also observable that, in describing the various abominations of popery, the National Covenant employs many terms, which, though familiar to the Church of Rome, that mystery of iniquity, yet cannot well be supposed to be fully understood by every Protestant reader who may consent unto the covenant. This much, however, he may see at once, that these strange and anti-scriptural terms must be descriptive of such human inventions as are entirely beside the Word of God, being added to the things contained in that sacred book, and therefore ought to be rejected. An instance or two will serve to illustrate this. We renounce, quote, his five bastard sacraments, unquote. Everyone probably does not know that these are marriage, ordination, confirmation, penance, and extreme unction, unquote. But Christians in general can very easily know that the only sacraments in the New Testament are baptism and the Lord's Supper, and consequently that no institution besides can ever consistently be admitted as a proper sacrament. Mention is made of the Pope's, quote, shavelings, unquote. There may possibly be many sincere believers in the Protestant churches who cannot tell that these mean his, quote, monks or friars of different orders who have their heads shaved in different forms to mark their distinguished pretended holiness, unquote. But all may know that no such orders were ever appointed by Christ, and therefore the doctrine respecting them can make no part of the faith delivered to the saints. The same may be said of all 
the other anti-Christian abominations. Meanwhile, it is not intended to, to discourage, but rather to recommend such proper research as after the knowledge of these things, as may enable us to oppose them with judgment and precision. Turning our attention to the Solemn League of the Three Nations, we find that in the first article we engage to preserve the true Reformed religion where it is already established, and to carry forward the Reformation where it is not yet completed. Say not the Scriptures that this is our duty? Quote, Whereunto we have already attained. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Remember how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast. Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee." Unquote. In the second article, we profess to use our best endeavors without partiality for the extirpation of popery, prelacy, superstition, heresy, schism, profaneness, and whatsoever should be found contrary to sound doctrine and the power of godliness. All these have oftentimes been clearly proven to be gross corruptions of Jehovah's worship and open violations of his holy law, concerning which his express language is, quote, Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. What things soever I command you observe to do it, thou shalt not add thereunto, nor diminish from it. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Unquote. In the third article, we understand, excuse me, we undertake to preserve the rights and privileges of the civil authorities in the preservation and defense of true religion and liberties of the kingdoms. Nothing can be more consonant to the divine injunctions, quote, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. He is the minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he is a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing." Unquote. In these passages, the lawful authority, official character, and important duty of the magistrate are inseparably connected with the people's obedience and support. In the fourth article, we solemnly resolve to employ our endeavors for discovering and bringing seasonably to condign punishment all such incendiaries and malignants as wickedly hinder the Reformation and foment divisions in the Church, which is nothing more than what the Lord himself requires when he says, quote, Execute judgment in the morning, and deliver him that is spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision, unquote. In the fifth article, we swear to do what we can in our respective places for preserving to all posterity the settled peace and union of the kingdoms. The union principally intended respects the common faith delivered to the saints in all its branches, and therefore the endeavoring to keep it exactly corresponds to the inspired recommendation, quote, endeavoring to keep the unity of spirit in the bond of peace, unquote. In the last article of this league, we bind ourselves to assist and defend each other and jointly to persevere in prosecuting the great ends of the covenant, without giving place to indifference or defection. God himself certainly commands so much, quote, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of God. Stand fast in one spirit, and with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Unquote. To covenants, the matter of which is so evidently agreeable to the unalterable precepts of the moral law, we may safely apply the inspired apostle's language, quote, Though it be but a man's covenant, Yet, if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto." Unquote. Indeed, if it can once be proved, as it has often been, in the most convincing manner, that the Church, as such, as well as men in other capacities, may warrantably enter into public scriptural covenant, covenants at all, their obligation must necessarily be perpetual, inasmuch as the Church, collectively considered, is still the same permanent society which can never die, though the arguments of whom she may have been composed in any given period, should be no more. And if even civil deeds amongst men, when they are legally executed, bind not only the persons presently entering into them, but them, their heirs, and successors to all generations, much more must we consider these religious covenants, which are executed according to the revealed will of our heavenly lawgiver, to be binding not only upon the generation of the church more immediately entering into them, 
but also on their heirs and successors to the end of the world. Concerning these covenants, some have proposed the query, quote, In what sense can they be said, as they are in our testimony, to be of divine authority or obligation? Unquote. We reply, The divine authority of heaven's great sovereign is, evidently interposed, in requiring us to enter into such covenants, quote, Vow unto the Lord your God, unquote. And when once we have entered into them, the same divine authority binds us to performance, quote, Pay that which thou hast vowed, unquote. And to these that the great and dreadful name, the Lord our God, is invoked in the solemn transaction, while his declarative glory among men is deeply concerned in the faithful ful fulfillment of our engagements. So that, besides the intrinsic obligation of the covenants, viewed simply as human deeds, whereby men bind their souls, there is, in all such covenants, an obligation of divine authority, requiring first to make, and then to perform our covenants. From the invocation of the divine name, considering Jehovah as witness and avenger, and from the interfering with the divine glory in the keeping or violating of our oath. Hence, in Scripture, the same oath is, in one respect, considered as the covenant of the man giving his hand, and, in another respect, as the Lord's covenant, whose glory is concerned in it. Our testimony, if properly attended to, explains itself, telling us, the covenants, quote, are of divine authority, obligation, as having their foundations upon the word of God, unquote. Some have also questioned, quote, whether or not the covenants can properly lay us under any additional obligations to duty, besides what we are already under from the divine law, unquote. In all disputes, the explaining of our terms is highly requisite. If by any additional or superadded obligation, be meant something introduced to supply a defect or to bind where we were at liberty. It is plain that no human covenants can, in this sense, impose a superadded obligation, for God's law is absolutely perfect and necessarily binds to every possible duty, both as to matter and manner, according to the station which we fill. But if by superadded obligation be meant a further and very awful consideration, which also should have a strong influence in, in prompting us to the faithful discharge of this duty, in this sense, the covenants undoubtedly contain an additional obligation. For, besides the authority of the divine law obliging us, we, by our own voluntary deed, likewise bind ourselves to the conscientious performance of the same things. Those who approve of the original covenants themselves cannot consistently deny the propriety of the Alcansal renovation, which is also mentioned in this, term, this article of our terms, seeing it must be obvious to everyone who hath properly perused that deed that there is not the least substantial alteration. After omitting the designations, noblemen, gentlemen, etc., which could not apply to them, being only a few private Christians, with one minister and a probationer, and after adding a few marginal notes, accommodating them to the real circumstances in which the swearers then were, the old covenants remain as they were. There are, indeed, accompanying that renovation an enlarged acknowledgment of sins and an engagement to duties. These also were necessary, in order to accommodate the solemn transaction unto the existing circumstances of the nation in which the swearers lived, as well as unto their own condition.